So I just wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, and tonight, this is going to be, obviously, it's not a webinar. We can see everybody. Um, and you can chat to each other and uh, individually and so forth. Um, but during the presentation, it may be best to hold your questions, unless there's something pressing, um, to the end of the presentation. And then we can op open it up for discussion and Q&A. Um, but during, if there's anything pressing, please let us know um, so Amanda can pause and explain. But in, typically, it, it's easier to go through the whole presentation. Um, so on that note, I wanted to just thank you for coming um, and wanted to introduce Amanda Davis, who is the project manager. She is the sole employee of, this, of, this, of our enterprise and has been working with us for now six years, overseeing all elements of the project, doing research, making sure our website works and helping us and helping everybody understand the importance of LGBT place-based history. Her background is in um, architectural history and has a degree in historic preservation from Columbia University um, and has worked for the New York Landmarks Conservant, uh, I'm sorry, the Landmarks Preservation Commission then worked in California and then worked for Gr the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation now known as Village Preservation. And we were fortunate enough to have her as our wingman uh, personnel person overseeing this project from its inception and is a wonderful editor and writer and historian. So on that note, I, uh, I'd like to introduce Amanda and let her take it away. Thanks, Ken. And uh, thank you to everyone joining. I see some people entering the waiting room who are, and are, who are here who actually lived through some of this history. So um, thank you for being here and for sharing your, your stories. So, um, I'm just going to start tonight's talk by saying that it's the middle of a three-part series that explores historic lesbian spaces in New York City. Some of you may have attended our first program, 1970s Lesbian Activism and Community, last month. Uh, but for those of you who, who would like to see it uh, or would like to see it again, it's available on our YouTube page, so please check it out. Our final talk in the series will be Progressive Performers and Lesbian Lives on December 13th. So we invite you to register for that event if you haven't already. I also wanna take a moment to thank Humanities New York for sponsoring this series and helping us share the vibrant cultural heritage of New York City's lesbian community. Um, also upcoming on November 30th is a talk with Alan Ellenslig, um, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, on his new book, George Platt Lines, The Daring Eye which will take a closer look at the celebrated photographer who came to prominence after photographing famous writers such as Jean Cocteau and Gertrude, Gertrude Stein and the George Balanchine and Lincoln Kirstein Ballet Company. So they're today known as the New York City Ballet. Ellen Zweig will also highlight historic queer places in New York City that shaped lines of life and work as an early 20th century artist. So we hope you'll join us for that one. Tonight's talk will focus on Greenwich Village, obviously, and the lesbian and bisexual women who helped shape its character and history as one of the most influential and famous neighborhoods in the world. The map you see here is from our website, which at this point features over 300, uh, 375 historic sites connected to the city's LGBTQ community in all five boroughs. I've added in a red arrow here for those of you who may not be familiar with the city to show where Greenwich Village is in downtown Manhattan. We use these eight color-coded pins at right to highlight the kinds of sites that we document. And then on the left are five categories to help filter the map based on what you may be interested in finding. So there are lots of ways to kind of make sense of all of these sites um, if you, and if you're looking for something specific. Uh, in this case, I've clicked on the Greenwich Village tag and um, you know, I could narrow the search down even further by clicking on a specific era, such as the 1950s or cultural significance, such as bars and nightlife or both. So you'll see all bars from the 50s pop up on the page. So this is everything we have so far in Greenwich Village um, for the entire community. Uh, of course, tonight looking specifically at those associated with the, the lesbian community. So uh, Greenwich Village was one of the first neighborhoods in New York City that allowed and gradually accepted an open gay and lesbian presence, which resulted in its emergence as an early and nationally significant LGBTQ enclave. 
We're fortunate in that so many LGBTQ associated sites in Greenwich Village are protected by historic district designations that date back to 1969. These are protected by the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission, the, the local um, city agency. So even though their LGBTQ histories are not always officially recognized in these reports, the survival of these buildings and landscapes allows us to reinterpret the neighborhood today for its significance to LGBTQ history and gives people the ability to walk around and connect with this, this history themselves. And um, as Ken mentioned earlier, we've actually just received a grant from the National Park Service to provide an LGBTQ overlay to the Greenwich Village Historic District um, in order to officially recognize the community's transformative impact on the neighborhood. So that's something uh, that we're looking forward to sharing with you in, in the coming year or two or three, <laughs> however long that might take. Um, so before I begin, I wanted to give you a brief snapshot of queer, the queer history of the village before looking more specifically at sites associated with the lesbian community. All of the sites featured tonight are on our website if you want to read more about them. This area of the city began to see what would now be considered LGBTQ spaces emerge in the 1850s, with the earliest known surviving building being FAPS. Walt Whitman was a central figure here around the time he wrote 12 famously homoerotic calamus poems. And in the 1890s, sites like the slide on Bleecker Street, a sketch of which is seen at right, was a place where male prostitutes solicited men for sex and was closed by the police in 1892 for this reason. I only just noticed tonight these two photos have this, a man sitting at left on around a round table with other men, kind of <laughs> random, anyway. Um, Greenwich Village had been home to an affluent merchant class period uh, uh, class before a period of decline eventually made the area affordable at the end of the 19th century to immigrants, bohemians, gay men and lesbians, and others who did not fit in elsewhere. George Chauncey notes in his book, Gay New York, that the village came to represent the rest of the city, uh, to the rest of the city, what New York as a whole represented to the rest of the nation, a peculiar social territory in which the normal social constraints on behavior seem to have been suspended and where men and women built unconventional lives outside the family nexus. In the 1920s and 19, uh, 1910s and 1920s, tea rooms on and around McDougal Street near Washington Square Park attracted a bohemian crowd and in the case of Mad Hatter on West 4th Street was run for a number of years by a lesbian couple. By the 1920s, Greenwich Village was one of the most famous neighbor uh, gay enclaves in the world. Stewart's Cafeteria near Christopher Park was hugely popular with gay men and lesbians in the 1930s. The gay artist Paul Cadmus depicted the space in this sexually charged 1934 oil painting at Wright. In the post-World War II era, the San Remo on Bleecker Street was a famous hangout of beatniks, many of whom were gay. The Cafe Chino on, on Cornelia Street was where Off-Off-Broadway Theater was born and gay-themed plays were staged regularly for the first time ever. And nightlife spots like the lesbian bar Swing Rendezvous on McDougal Street provided queer people the opportunity to meet each other and be themselves in ways they often could not be in their personal and professional lives. The, the sustained presence of an LGBTQ community in the village allowed for the growth of community spaces and gay owned businesses, such as the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop, and for game changing activism, such as the now famous June 1969 uprising at the Stonewall Inn, which served as a key turning point in an LGBTQ rights movement that had already taken root some 20 years earlier. After Stonewall, the queer community became more visible through the formation of more radical activist groups and through the annual Pride March, the first of which took place in 1970 a year after the Stonewall Uprising. The Pride March has had, a, has had different routes over the years, but in the early days began in the village, went up Sixth Avenue and ended in Central Park. And that's what you see here. The Greenwich Village waterfront was also an important space for various groups within the community. And the Christopher Street Pier was known for gay cruising and as a refuge for those who had nowhere else to go, such as trans activist Sylvia Rivera, who also helped and advocated for homeless queer youth. And uh, Sylvia, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Marsha P. Johnson in the photo behind her was also influential in this regard. Today, while Greenwich Village has become enormously expensive, 
LGBTQ life and community spaces can still be found. And of course, an interest in its queer history is more alive than ever. This large tour group of gay bars come and gone stands in front of Julius's bar at the corner of 10th and Waverly, which has thankfully survived the pandemic and is ready to welcome you back on your next visit to the village. So now we'll, re uh, we'll revisit some of that history, but through the lens of the lesbian community. First through residences of lesbian artists and writers, then through sites of activism associated with lesbians, and finally through lesbian bars and nightlife spaces. I should point out that the following historic sites are merely a selection of lesbian spaces in Greenwich Village that we feature on our website, and in some cases highlight notable women who appear to have been bisexual. The first site is the Bernice Abbott and Elizabeth McCausland residence and studio at 50 Commerce Street, where the couple lived and worked in two flats on the fourth floor from 1935 to 1965. If you love looking at old photos of New York City, then you'll love Bernie Sabbath, if you're not uh, familiar with her work already. Abbott was a photographer, and around the time of her move to Commerce Street, she received funding from the Federal Art Project to document the city's ever-changing landscape. Over a three-year period, she took hundreds of photos of city life and architecture in all five boroughs and printed over 300 images that appear in the now classic book, Changing New York. McCausland, who was an art critic, provided text for that book and many others and taught at Barnard College and the New School. I've picked a few photos of Abbott to share with you tonight, but I encourage you to look through more of them because they're just an incredible snapshot of 1930s New York. I figured we'd start with the Greenwich Village shot. This one is of a classic city storefront in the form of Zito's Bakery on Bleecker Street taken in 1937. This one breaks my heart every time I see it, and I know a lot of people agree. It's the original Penn Station designed by McKinley White that was demolished in the 1960s for Madison Square Garden, some 30 years after this photo was taken. This is Abbott's 1936 shot of tenements on Pike Street and the Manhattan Bridge on the Lower East Side. And finally, this is a warehouse along the Brooklyn waterfront in present day Dumbo taken in 1936. This building is still there. The village was also home for a time to Patricia Highsmiths who lived in a one bedroom apartment at the corner of Grove and Bleecker Streets uh, with her mother and stepfather from 1940 to 1942, although they had a tense relationship. The entrance to the upper floors is on Grove Street at right towards the rear of the building. Highsmith lived here while she was a student at Barnard and often frequented the nearby lesbian bars, as well as Marie's Crisis Cafe on Grove Street. Even though she lived in the village for a relatively short time, it had a lasting influence on her and her writing. Her most notable work with a queer theme was The Price of Salt, published in 1952 under the pseudonym Claire Morgan. A lesbian love story, it was based on Highsmith Booth brief encounter with a woman while working at Bloomingdale's and was groundbreaking in lesbian literature, providing a relatively happy ending in an era when this was not allowed in publication. The story was later republished under the title Carol and made into a movie of the same name. Highsmith is perhaps more widely known for the talented Mr. Ripley. Um, and then the two books, Edith's Diary and Found in the Street feature Grove Street where she formerly lived and Greenwich Village. This quirky house on Charles Street was the writing studio of children's book author, Margaret Wise Brown, but with a twist. When she worked here from 1942 to 52, the house was actually located uptown on the Upper East Side. In the late 1960s, long after Brown had passed away, the house was moved to this spot, which is a great story on its own, but uh, not for tonight, that'd be another hour. Um, Brown was a prolific best-selling author of children's books who today might identify as bisexual. She wrote the majority of her more than 100 books in this house, including her most famous, The, the Runaway Bunny and Goodnight Moon. Her, frame, her fame grew as the post-World War II baby boom led to an increased demand for children's books. At that time, the house was located on the rear of the lot of 1335 York Avenue on the Upper East Side, as I mentioned, which I've highlighted in green on this map on the left. 
She entered through the building at the front facing York Avenue and the space in the middle led to the house's name of Cobbleport, which you see mentioned in tiny letters uh, in the Life Magazine caption at right. Her whimsical studio became an integral part of her public image as a children's book author and uh, Life called it her bucolic oasis in the midst of Manhattan's skyscrapers. Many people believe that this was her house but she actually lived nearby on East End Avenue with socialite Blanche Ulrich, who went by the name, uh, the pen name, Michael Strange. Brown and Strange had begun a long-term tumultuous relationship in 1942, and Brown sought out this Cobbleport studio as a separate space to write. Brown's relationship with Strange inspired several stories, including the dark wood of the golden birds. The Cobbleport house was featured in Brown's book, The Hidden House, published a year after her premature death. Continuing with the writing theme, playwright and activist Lorraine Hansberry lived on the top floor of this building on Beaker Street from 1953 to 1960. She lived for most of those years with her husband, though privately she identified as a lesbian. We successfully listed this site on the National Register of Historic Places last year for its association with Hansberry one of several sites in the city that we've nominated to the National Register for the significance to LGBT history. And obviously the site is also significant to black history as well. Hansberry moved to New York in the early 1950s and contributed extensively to the civil rights movement and spoke out about economic and gender inequality until her untimely death in 1965. The photo at right shows her speaking at an NAACP rally in Washington Square Park in 1959. She is best known for her groundbreaking play, A Raisin in the Sun, which was based on the racial discrimination her family faced in her native Chicago. The play was written in her apartment on Bleecker Street, which you can see in the photo at left. She has been described as being at her typewriter often in an apartment surrounded by books, and you can see them in the background. Um, and she's seated uh, on the right in the right-hand photo with the director and producers of the play, as well as its, as well as its star, Sidney Poitier, who went on to star in the, in the film version. The award-winning play made Hansberry the first Black woman to have her work staged on Broadway when it premiered at the Ethel Barrymore Theater in 1959. Her friend, the civil rights activist and writer James Baldwin, later wrote of the play's significance to the Black community saying, I had never in my life before seen so many Black people in the theater. And the reason was that never before in the entire history of the American theater had so much of the truth of Black people's lives been seen on the stage. Several of Hansberry's lesbian friends, including a woman she was in a relationship with, attended the play's Broadway premiere. Hansberry also counted many influential lesbians in her social circle, mainly white women, such as Patricia Highsmith, and wrote several short stories and letters under a pseudonym that she submitted to national gay and lesbian magazines, providing insight into her views on homosexuality and gender expectations in 1950s America. The short story on the left was published in the early issue of the latter, the national magazine of the Daughters of Belize, the country's first lesbian magazine. LGBTQ rights pioneers, Phyllis Lyon and Del Martin, who founded the group in San Francisco in 1955, visited Hansberry at her Bleecker Street apartment and acknowledged Hansberry's important contributions to the magazine in its earliest years. And uh, as an aside, their San Francisco home was recently landmarked. So a great uh, achievement for the West Coast. Here are some other sites associated with lesbian artists and writers in the neighborhood that you can read about on our website. Now we'll look at some other sites associated with lesbian activists. Eleanor Roosevelt wasn't involved in lesbian specific activism, but she's an example of a female political figure who had relationships with women and counted a number of influential lesbians in her social circle. From 1942 to 1949, she lived in this apartment building off Washington Square Park, uh, first with her husband, President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and then on her own after her death, after his death too. 
Roosevelt was the longest serving first lady and she took an active role in politics, refusing to accept the traditional roles assigned to previous first ladies. She was appointed the first United States delegate to the United Nations in 1945, where she helped lead the effort to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which passed in 1948. In 1933, she began a long-term lesbian relationship with journalist Lorena Hickok, herself a resident of New York City, whose apartment is included on our website. Over the 30 years that they knew each other, they exchanged almost 4,000 known letters. Influential les lesbian women in Roosevelt's social circle included Marion Dickman and Nancy Cook, lifelong partners who were active in progressive politics and lived on West 12th Street. And I'm sure you'll hear more about them in our December program. Edie Windsor is a name that many of you probably recognize as the lead plaintiff in the Supreme Court case, which overturned Section 3 of the Des Defense of Marriage Act, DOMA, in 2013. Before that landmark event, she lived with Dr. Thea Spire in their apartment at 25th Avenue off Washington Square Park since the, uh, the mid-1970s. The site is also well known as the residence of Larry Kramer, who we um, also include on our website. Windsor and Spire met in 1963 at Portofino, an Italian restaurant at the corner of Thompson and Bleecker that was a discreet meeting place frequented on Friday evenings by lesbians and the building is on the upper right with the ground floor being the former Portofino space. The couple was among the first to register for domestic partnership uh, when New York City began the process in 1993. They married in Canada in 2007 and at that time New York State recognized same-sex marriages from Canada. After Spire's death in 2009, Windsor had to pay federal estate taxes since the federal government didn't recognize same-sex marriages at that time, and uh, DOMA defined marriage as the union of one man and one woman. She fought back and won multiple legal challenges that led to her 2013 victory, which overturned DOMA. Windsor became a, a national celebrity for gay rights. After her death, a plaque at her residence at 2 Fifth Avenue was installed at the entrance to the building. We're standing here, uh, Jay, Ken and I, with uh, Judith Case Windsor, Edie's second wife. In the 1970s, a number of important gathering and activist spaces opened in the village for lesbians, one of which was the Women's Coffee House, which was located on the ground floor and entered from a garden space on 7th Avenue South. This coffee house was located here from 1974 to 1978. And it's that door right behind the car there. Took us a bit to figure that out. <laughs> um, the space was entirely women run and women owned and was funded by the Women's Coffee House Collective. Six of the seven women in this collective identified as lesbians. The coffee house became a hub for lesbian political activism, for example, hosting meetings of dykes and tykes an organization that advocated for the lesbian child custody rights. The inside space and garden sat 120 women. Musicians and poets performed here and lesbian feminist films were shown. The space was an alternative to lesbian bars, which were mafia owned and allowed women to be part of and create lesbian culture. The Women's Coffee House was one of the most popular sites serving the city's lesbian feminist population in the 1970s. Others included the bookstores Labyrinth and Dijuna Books and the restaurant Mother Courage, all of which are featured on our website. The parish house off this church, um, of this church off Washington Square Park was the longtime meeting space for the Salsa Soul Sisters, the oldest black lesbian organization in America. The group met here from 1976 uh, to 1987. Salsa Soul Sisters began as the Black Lesbian Caucus, a subcommittee of the Gay Activists Alliance. GAA was one of the most influential gay groups of the immediate post doma era and had its headquarters in this firehouse in Soho, which is now a New York City landmark. Renaming themselves Salsa Soul Sisters, the group's space in the parish house was an alternative to bars where lesbians of color had historically faced discrimination. Salsa Soul provided welcoming social events and weekly meetings on topics 
such as Racism and Single Lesbian Parenting. And it also published quarterly magazines and the Jemima Writers Collective to amplify the voices of lesbians of color. While the group welcomed all lesbians of color, its attendees were, pre were predominantly black. One member noted that there was no other place for women of color to go and sit down and talk about what it means to be a black lesbian in America, showing the significance of such a space. The group later moved to the LGBT Community Center on 13th Street, which is still, which is still located here, is also a New York City landmark. Since 1983, the building uh, has hosted a large and diverse range of groups, has an LGBT archive, and provides various programs and health resources. A number of lesbian groups have met here, including Las Buenas Amigas, a group for Latinas, seen here marching in the 1993 Women's Pride Parade in Jackson Heights, which um, has a number of Latino and Latina bars and uh, spaces. It has also served as a meeting space uh, the center for Asian lesbians of the East Coast. News clippings here cover a 1991 protest that the group participated in over the racial stereotypes in the Broadway musical, Miss Saigon. Salga, a queer group for South Asians, has also met at the center. In the 1990s and 2000s, the group protested the exclusion of gay groups from marching openly in the annual India Day Parade and other parades connected to Desi people. The center was also where the group Lesbian Avengers was founded. One of their ex actions was the 1994 protest at the Alice Austin House, a house museum on Staten Island that was the longtime home of photographer Alice Austin and her partner Gertrude Tate. At the time, the house museum would not acknowledge Austin and Tate as a couple, something that has thankfully changed. And we worked with the House Museum staff a few years ago to amend its National Register of Historic Places listing to include their lesbian relationship, as well as Austin's important photography that included lesbian subject matter. So protest led to change. Bars have played an incredibly significant role in LGBTQ life for well over a century as we'll see in the next section, but there were also challenges to overcome. One instance was at Cookies on 14th Street, which was the site of lesbian-led activism in the immediate post-Stonewall era. Cookies operated here from 1965 to 1973. This floor plan of Cookies was drawn by Gwendolyn Spiegel, one of our project consultants, who was also working on her graduate thesis about lesbian bars in New York City at the same time and, and uh, interviewed several people. This floor plan is, is the result of that, which is amazing and provides a great visual of what the space looked like in an era before Instagram and the internet has given us access to more photos than we know what to do with sometimes. You can see the dance floor at back. In the early 1970s, women of the Gay Liberation Front, an early post-Stonewall LGBTQ group, wanted to hold a dance at GLF's headquarters at Alternate U, seen at right. Led by activist Carla J, the women tried handing out flyers at Cookies for the dance, but were thrown out because the owner, who was also named Cookie, was worried they'd hurt her business. The bar itself was a mafia-owned lesbian bar, though Cookie herself was not particularly welcoming to lesbian patrons. After the dance, Martha Shelley led a group of GLF women and men to Cookies to protest the bar's handling of its lesbian patrons, and a number of other groups joined as well. This action, known as ZAP, which, is, which was a popular tactic employed by gay groups at the time to draw media attention to homophobic practices, took place in 1971 outside the bar. The event marked an era of change for lesbian bars and was emblematic of the more radical forms of protest that followed in the wake of Stonewall. And again, I just wanna point out some other sites in the neighborhood associated with lesbian activism and to also point you to our YouTube presentation from last month uh, led by Emily Kahn, another excellent project consultant that covers more of this history in depth. I'm going to end tonight's talk with a look at a selection of lesbian bars and nightlife spaces in the village. 
The first site uh, takes us back to the 1920s, the era I had mentioned earlier, where you start to see gay and lesbian owned businesses forming around McDougal Street, a block south of Washington Square Park. Eve's Hangout is a prime example of this and was in operation from 1924 to 1926 in the basement of this federal era uh, row house. Eve's Hangout was owned and operated by Eve Adams, the name adopted by a Polish Jewish lesbian immigrant and was a tea room popular with gay men and lesbians. In 1925, Adams published a book named Lesbian Love. And over a year later, she was arrested at her tea room and then tried and convicted soon after of obscenity for the book and for disorderly conduct or alleged attempted sex with a policewoman. As a result, Adams was deported in 1927 and sent back to Europe where she ultimately ended up in Paris. As the Nazis rose to power, she tried unsuccessfully to escape to the United States. And in 1943, she was arrested and sent to Auschwitz where she was murdered. In her memory, a street in Paris was renamed for her. Historian Jonathan Ned Katz recently released a book on Adams if you're interested in learning more about her story. Uh, on a lighter note, that's always a hard site to transition from. Um, I'm skipping over the 1930s and 1940s, but we do have lesbian bars on the website from those eras for you to check out. The Sea Colony was in operation from at least 1955 through the 1960s on 8th Avenue and was one of the most popular lesbian bars in Greenwich Village in the pre-Stonewall era. This photo shows that the sea colony occupied the ground floor of these three row houses. This was another lesbian bar documented by Gwendolyn and she spoke to a former bartender of the sea colony to put together this floor plan at right. The lesbian clientele here mostly fit into a butch femme dynamic where the butch or more masculine dressing of the pair would take the quote unquote man's role in the relationship such as buying drinks, leading in dance, open doors, etc., and the femme or more feminine presenting of the pair would take the quote unquote woman's role. The bartender that Gwendolyn interviewed mentioned that this dynamic even extended to where patrons typically congregated in the front room, the back end of the bar was where the butches usually sat, and the front was where the femme sat with the space on the left in the floor plan. The butches were especially a target of police brutality as dressing in clothes of the opposite sex was illegal in New York at the time. Raids on lesbian bars were often sexually violent and women arrested in these raids were sent to the nearby women's house of detention, which has since been demolished, but used to be next to the Jefferson Market Courthouse, which is now the Jefferson Market Library, you can see the tower, um, that's at the right of center. The women's house of detention was sardonically, sardonically referred to among bar patrons as the country club. There's a garden in that space for the building uh, where the building used to be. The ground floor of this building at the corner of Grove and 7th Avenue South held several lesbian bars from the 1970s to the 1990s, beginning with the Duchess in 1972. Unfortunately, this flyer is the only image we have connected to the Duchess. If you happen to know of others, we'd love to know about them, please share. Um, the Duchess included a racially and economically diverse crowd. Many of the earlier bars catered predominantly to middle-class white lesbians. And we have some documentation from the likes of black lesbian activist and writer, Audrey Lord, who mentioned uh, frequenting frequenting some of these places like the Pony Stable Inn and the Bagatelle in the pre-Stonewall era, but being met with discrimination. Um, this does not seem to have been the case at the Duchess. The Duchess space was small, but had a dance floor and a jukebox. It also offered Sunday buffet and table service, similar to other lesbian bars at the time. The Duchess offered women more freedom than earlier mafia run lesbian bars, which had its staff monitor bathroom use to supposedly prevent sexual activity. This was something that happened at the sea colony, for example. After it closed in 1982, the Duchess was replaced by several other lesbian bars, 
including Pandora's Box, which was especially po uh, popular with Black and Latina lesbians until it closed in 1992. I also wanted to point out that the Duchess is featured in this LGBT history walking tour map of Greenwich Village, which includes sites around Stonewall National Monument. The lower uh, red arrow points to the Duchess, and for context, the other arrow points to Stonewall, so they're very close together. Uh, we co-collaborated on this map and uh, to create it, and it's available on our website for free if you're interested. It's a great uh, snapshot of life in and around the monument. So I'm going to end tonight's talk with two lesbian bars that are still open. The first is Henrietta Hudson, appropriately on Hudson Street. Uh, it was preceded by Cubbyhole, a lesbian bar not to be confused with Cubbyhole, the one word, um, on 12th Street that I'll get to in a minute. Cubbyhole, two words, was opened by Elaine Ramagnoli, who recently passed away, and it operated here from 1971 to 1982. Stormé Delivery, a notable figure in the queer community, worked as a security guard here. Before this, Delivery had a long career as a male impersonator, a term used at the time, in the Jewel Box Review, which included performances at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. By 1989, Cubbyhole featured a video screen that played music videos, a new attraction for that era. After Cubbyhole closed in 1990, the space reopened and expanded a year later as Henrietta Hudson. Delivery continued to work as a security guard there. Lastly, Cubbyhole, the one word version, at the corner of 12th and 4th Streets, uh, was originally DT's Fat Cat, a bar opened by Tanya Saunders in 1987. Saunders later renamed it Cubbyhole, one word, in 1984 with uh, her friend Elaine Ramagnoli's permission. This is an up close shot of the bar, since it was a little hard to see in that first shot. Saunders was a Jewish refugee who escaped Nazi Germany with her mother in 1935. When she envisioned Cubbyhole, she wanted it to be an inclusive neighborhood fusion bar, which is how it still operates, though it is beloved as a lesbian bar. Saunders bequeathed the bar to Lisa Minichino, its current owner, after Saunders' death in 2018. The eclectic ceiling at Cubbyhole is perhaps, is perhaps its defining feature. An article from The Villager in the early 2000s noted that the bar managed to remain viable and popular despite the village's gentrification and the 1990s, early 2000s trend in les uh, lesbian nightlife towards clubs rather than bars. Cubbyhole thankfully survived the pandemic um, as did Henrietta Hudson, and this photo shows patrons enjoying the space again. The bar is one of only three remaining lesbian bars in all of New York City, uh, along with Henrietta Hudson, as I mentioned, and Ginger's in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And this slide is just to show other lesbian bars in Greenwich Village that we feature on our website, as well as a shout out to a talk that uh, Gwendolyn gave last year for us, that is now on YouTube. If you'd like to learn more about her research into the, uh, the city's lesbian bar scene, it goes much more in depth uh, and in including her thesis. So I hope you'll check out our website and follow us on social media if you're not already to learn more about um, the city's LGBTQ place based history. Thanks. And I guess we'll open it up to questions and chat. Thanks, Amanda. Um... And if there are any questions, um, please put them in the chat. Um, someone just asked if there are live walking tours planned. At the moment, there are still no live walking tours planned. Um, that may change, um, you know, not the, because of the timing that it gets so dark, um, but in the spring, we may resume them. Do we take donations is another question. Yes, we very <laughs> much so take donations. We are a, a scrappy little project surviving on donations. And thank you, someone just, uh, Christiana put the donate function in the chat. We will take small donations, large donations and so forth. But it's rather miraculous that we've kept this project going for this number of years. 
and we would appreciate any support you can have, you can contribute. Um, as they say, you can donate what's meaningful to you. <laughs> and I also put into the chat, back in chat. <laughs> um, the Hugh Ryan is coming out with a new book on the Women's House of Detention. Um, so I put that resource in the chat. There was a question. Someone's raising their hand. I can't quite see who that was, but I just saw it flip up there. There's a question about the Women's House of Detention. Um, why is there no plaque for commemorating the space there? Um, you know, th that I can't answer directly and some of my colleagues may wanna um, sort of chime in on that. Um, there may be a there has been no plaque to date. The garden is what is commemorating the space because I believe anecdotally that it was considered such a horrible institution and location that no one wanted to commemorate it. It was um, the garden was installed in about 1974-75 as a way to sort of reinvigorate the space as a community asset. Um, however, now it may be a way, there, there may be a need to commemorate the history of the Women's House of Detention. Um, so that history is, is acknowledged. And that is a very good point to raise for the people who maintain the garden. So Julie is the person who had her hand raised. Um, I don't know if I could see you're on mute and you're trying to ask a question. Maybe you want to unmute yourself or put the question in the chat. Yes, the recording will be available. Hi. You watch again. We will add it to our YouTube page. Hello? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Julie. Yes, I was just, I really enjoyed this. I spent a lot of time with the Duchess from 1978 until its closing. And I also wanted to just throw out there because I'm sure other readers have, um, maybe have been to the Sahara on the Upper East Side. The Lib. The Lib. There were so many oh, other beautiful, beautiful uh, lesbian bars that were around at that time. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to mention them because they weren't brought up in this, in this uh, video. And uh, just say that they were just so important to me as a young gay woman coming out um, as a 17 year old in the early 80s, late 70s, and also Joanne's on 8th Avenue and 14th Street. And I think Joanne was a woman who had been involved in bars around that, you know, around that area for many years. And finally, she got to open her own bar. So I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. That's great. great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, we're familiar with Sahara's. Um, and as a historic preservation project, we're looking at extant sites, so, the, so those sites that are still standing. And unfortunately, the building that Sahara's was in was demolished. Um, but it doesn't, it, we, we're aware of it and we certainly um, are tracking it. Uh, just gonna ask if we have a list of the various authors and their books that we could reference for those who would like to read some of our historical literature. Every site that we have on our website has a sources section for further reading. So. Uh, there were some sites tonight that struck your interest. If you go to that entries page, you'll see sources. Um, we also have um, our a resources page. Uh, got its own page on the website with links to other projects around the country um, and in the UK that are documenting LGBTQ history in, in the form of historic places, which um, is great to check out as well. If there are no other questions, I mean, we we just posted, um, or we're soon to be posting um, Club 82, which was not necessarily a lesbian space, but it was a space operated by Anna Genovese, who um, was from the mafia crime family. And it's just interesting, you know, we didn't get into it in that much detail about the mafia's relationship to um, the control of many bars, including many lesbian spaces. But that yeah, means. and just also to reiterate that tonight's 
talk was focused on Greenwich Village. And so if you're interested in other parts of the city, please um, go to the website and check out the map. Um, we have a breakdown by borough as well. So lots more history to discover. And we're always adding more stuff. Amanda, there's a question of where Gwendolyn's talk on uh, queer, you know, the Cheers Queers. Oh yeah, cheer, that um, Cheers YouTube? Queers. That's on YouTube. And we also, so yeah, if you go to our YouTube page, I think Christiana just included a link. Yeah, she did. Yeah. So if you go a little bit further up, we have a, a direct link to our YouTube page. So you'll find the Cheers Queers one there. It's also linked on several of the lesbian bar spaces on the website that Gwendolyn worked on. Mm. Well, oh, thank you. Mm. Oh, someone's Sorry. asking about when we, uh, well, when you guys started to start the uh, organization. Well, that could take about another hour. Um, that, <laughs> we all, Jay, myself, and Andrew have known each other for decades, and we're involved in an organization called OLGAD in the early, in, coincide with Stonewall 25. And we sort of kicked the can down the road. And then in 2014, we um, earnestly started um, the, the project and started raising money for it. And then we launched it officially in 2015. Um, but it's wonderful to see this interest in LGBT place-based history and how it has evolved in the last 30 years and how people really understand the importance of this. And I like to say that while we're documenting tangible spaces and those that one can visually see on the street, the impact is beyond that. The intangible benefits create a sense of pride, continuity, and identity, and really are important, not just for people who are attending the event like this tonight, but to those people who are coming out and not even in New York City or in at places where LGBT spaces have existed, but where they can see online and do research and know that they're not alone and have a connection to the past and have an identity for the future. So Amanda, do you wanna add anything or end on a, a high note? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, well, I, I guess just to reiterate to, go and check out our website, especially with the winter coming. It's good cold weather reading. And <laughs> uh, we have a lot of uh, additional uh, visuals, uh, photographs and ephemera uh, on these sites. And we're always interested in hearing uh, if you have sites that you feel should be on the map that aren't there already, um, we'd love to hear from you. And in the meantime, we'll just keep them um, you know, researching and writing and adding sites to let's say. And, and if anyone has specific questions, I mean, there was a question about volunteers. I think it's info at nyclgbtsites.org. Please email us, or it would be amanda at nyclgbtsites.org for specific questions. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for dropping by.